Imagine this. It's the year 415 CE. A brilliant woman walks through the streets of Alexandria, the greatest center of learning in the ancient world. She's just finished teaching a class on astronomy to some of the brightest minds of her time. But in just a few hours, she'll be dead. Murdered by an angry mob. Her crime? Being too smart, too influential, and perhaps too dangerous for her time. So, who exactly was Hypatia? Well, here's where things get a bit tricky. Historians are uncertain of different aspects of Hypatia's life. For example, Hypatia's date of birth is one that is highly debated. Most scholars agree she was born around 350 to 370 CE in Alexandria, Egypt, though some sources push this to as late as 370 CE. But here's what we do know for certain. She was the daughter of Theon of Alexandria, who was himself a distinguished mathematician and astronomer. And this is where Hypatia's story becomes extraordinary. Theon raised Hypatia in a world of education. Now, in the fourth century, this was revolutionary. Most women couldn't read, let alone study advanced mathematics. Picture ancient Alexandria. This wasn't just any city. It was the intellectual hub of the ancient world, home to the famous Library of Alexandria. Think of it as the Google, Harvard and NASA of its time, all rolled into one magnificent city. By her time, Alexandria was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, having been conquered by Julius Caesar some four centuries earlier. Hypatia grew up surrounded by scrolls, mathematical uh, instruments, and the greatest minds of her era. Her father didn't just educate her, he treated her as his intellectual equal. Uh, this was practically unheard of in ancient times. While other girls her age were learning domestic skills, Hypatia was solving geometric problems and studying the movements of stars. She is the earliest female mathematician of whose life and work reasonably detailed knowledge exists. Let that sink in for a moment. She's the first woman in mathematics whose story we can actually tell in detail. That's both amazing and heartbreaking. Amazing that we know about her. Heartbreaking that there were probably many others whose stories are lost forever. Now, you might be wondering, were there other women like Hypatia during her time? The short answer is extremely few and none quite like her. In the ancient world, women's roles were severely limited. Most women, regardless of social class, were expected to marry young, have children and manage households. Education was largely reserved for men and advanced mathematics and philosophy Forget about it. But Hypatia was different. She never married. And this was a conscious choice that would have been scandalous in, in her time. Ancient sources tell us she was beautiful and had many suitors, but she rejected all marriage proposals. Why? Because she was devoted to her intellectual pursuits. There's even a story that when one persistent suitor wouldn't leave her alone, she showed him her menstrual cloths and said, This is what you really love, my young man, but you do not love beauty for its own sake. Quirky? Absolutely. Effective? Definitely. She went beyond the mathematics and astronomy of her father's expertise, learning philosophy. She became head of the Neoplatonic school in Alexandria, which means she was literally teaching some of the most powerful men in the Roman Empire. Her students included future bishops, governors, and philosophers. What truly set her apart wasn't just her gender. It was her combination of mathematical genius, philosophical wisdom, and charismatic teaching. Ancient sources describe her as an exceptional orator who could hold audiences spellbound. In a world where public speaking was crucial for influence, she was a master. Here's something fascinating. She was also a skilled inventor and engineer. She improved the design of the astrolabe. 
a complex instrument used for navigation and astronomy. She also invented an improved version of the hydrometer, which measures the density of liquids. This woman wasn't just thinking about abstract mathematics, she was solving real-world problems. So, what exactly did Hypatia accomplish that still matters today? Well, hold on to your hats because this is impressive. First, her mathematical work. She wrote commentaries on several major mathematical works, including Apollonius's Conics, which deals with the mathematical properties of cones and is still studied today. She also worked on Diophantus's Arithmetica, which is considered one of the foundations of algebra. Hypatia was the first woman to make a substantial contribution to the development of mathematics. But here's what's remarkable. None of her original works survive today. Everything we know about her mathematical contributions comes from references by other mathematicians and her students. It's like knowing Shakespeare was a great playwright, but having lost all his plays except for other people's reviews. In astronomy, she made significant contributions to understanding the movement of celestial bodies. She taught the heliocentric model, the idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun more than a thousand years before Copernicus made it famous in Europe. Talk about being ahead of your time. Most historians now recognize Hypatia not only as a mathematician and scientist, but also as a philosopher. She was a Neoplatonist, which was a philosophical school that combined Plato's ideas with mystical and religious elements. But here's where it gets interesting. She advocated for rational thinking and scientific inquiry over blind faith. Her teaching style was revolutionary too. Instead of just lecturing, she encouraged questions and debate. She taught her students to think critically and question everything, including religious dogma. In a time when questioning established beliefs could be dangerous, this was incredibly brave. Her influence extended far beyond academia. She then taught philosophy and presumably the prerequisite mathematics. To students who went on to become influential leaders throughout the Roman Empire, she was essentially training the next generation of intellectuals and politicians. My dear viewers, let's talk about something that would ultimately cost Hypatia her life, her religious and philosophical beliefs. Hypatia lived during a time of massive religious upheaval. The Roman Empire was transitioning from traditional pagan beliefs to Christianity. Emperor Constantine had legalized Christianity in 313 CE and by Hypatia's time it was becoming the dominant religion. But Hypatia was a pagan, specifically a Neoplatonist. This doesn't mean she was against religion entirely, but she believed in the power of reason and scientific inquiry over blind faith. She famously said, and this is one of the few direct quotes we have from her, fables should be taught as fables, myths as myths, and miracles as poetic fantasies. To teach superstitions as truths is a most terrible thing. This was not a popular opinion in increasingly Christian Alexandria. Hypatia wasn't an atheist. She believed in, in a divine principle. But she thought the best way to understand the divine was through mathematics, astronomy and rational philosophy. She saw geometric harmony and mathematical beauty as reflections of divine order. Her approach was inclusive and tolerant. She had Christian, Jewish and pagan students and she treated all philosophical traditions with respect. But she insisted that all beliefs should be examined through the lens of reason. This put her in direct conflict with certain Christian leaders who believed that faith alone was sufficient and that too much questioning could lead people away from God. The irony is that many of her students were Christians who saw no conflict between their faith and her teaching, but unfortunately not everyone was so open-minded. Now we come to the most tragic and controversial part of Hypatia's story, her death.
And yes, she was indeed killed by Christians, but the full story is more complex than you might expect. In 415 CE, Alexandria was politically unstable. There was a power struggle between Orestes, the Roman prefect, governor of Alexandria, and Cyril, the Christian patriarch, religious leader of the city. Hypatia was a close advisor to Orestes and had significant political influence. She was killed by a fanatical Christian sect. But it's important to understand that this wasn't official church policy. It was the action of a radical mob led by a reader named Peter. The murder itself was horrific. They then tore her body apart and burned it. Historical accounts describe how the mob dragged her from her chariot, stripped her and killed her with broken pottery shards in a church. But why did they kill her? It wasn't simply because she was a pagan. There were many pagans still living in Alexandria. The reasons were complex. First, political. She was seen as an obstacle to Cyril's power because of her influence over Orestes. Second, social. She represented the old intellectual elite that some Christians saw as a threat to their growing dominance. Third, gender. A powerful unmarried woman who influenced men was threatening to traditional gender roles. Fourth, religious. Her rational approach to philosophy and her criticism of superstition angered religious extremists. For example, Kathleen Wider proposes that the murder of Hypatia marked the end of classical antiquity, and Stephen Greenblatt writes that her murder effectively marked the downfall of Alexandrian intellectual life. However, this might be somewhat dramatic. Intellectual life continued, but it was certainly a dark moment in history. So, why should we care about a woman who died over 1600 years ago? Well, Hypatia's story is remarkably relevant today. First, she represents the importance of women in STEM fields. She was doing advanced mathematics and astronomy when society said women couldn't handle such subjects. Every time a woman enters a science or math classroom today, she's walking in Hypatia's footsteps. Second, she embodies the value of critical thinking and rational inquiry. In our age of information overload and fake news, her insistence on questioning everything and seeking evidence is more important than ever. Third, her story is a cautionary tale about what happens when extremism overrides tolerance and reason. She was killed not for being wrong, but for being different and for encouraging others to think for themselves. Fourth, she shows us that education and intellectual curiosity are powerful forces for change. Her students went on to influence the Roman Empire, carrying her ideas across the ancient world. Today she's recognized as a pioneering figure in mathematics, astronomy and philosophy. There are craters on the Moon and Venus named after her. Astronomical software bears her name and she's become a symbol of women's intellectual achievements. She became the victim of a particularly brutal murder at the hands of a gang. But her ideas survived and continue to inspire people today. Her story reminds us that throughout history, there have always been extraordinary women pushing boundaries, making discoveries and inspiring others, even when their names were forgotten or their achievements minimized. The next time you look up at the stars, remember Hypatia, the woman who studied their movements, mapped their paths. That's the power of a brilliant mind. It echoes through the centuries, inspiring generations long after the person is gone. And that, my friends, is true immortality. If you enjoyed learning about Hypatia, let me know in the comments who you'd like me to cover next. There are so many incredible women throughout history whose stories deserve to be told. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more stories about the remarkable people who changed our world.